Welcome to the Successful Nurse Coach Podcast. On this podcast, Laura and Shelby, both board certified nurse coaches, show you how to make as much money as you want in private practice as a nurse coach. Hello and welcome back everybody to the Successful Nurse Coach Podcast. It is Shelby here today and I'm going to be flying solo and sharing a little bit of a story with all of you and um, not going to lie, I'm feeling a little nervous about this one for two reasons. One, it's pretty personable or not personable, personal, got that baby brain right now, personal and recording solo. I don't know if we have any other podcast creators that are tuning in right now, but recording solo is such a challenge for both me and Laura, because um, even if you get off topic, you always have someone bringing you back to ground or to square one. And um, when you're recording solo, you could just really go on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, kind of like I'm doing right now, and get lost in the sauce. (laughs) So I have about Mm, four functioning brain cells right now. I am in the very deep depths of newborn life. It is Groundhog Day every day. My baby girl is about, oh, she's almost six weeks old when at the time I'm recording this and she's perfect. She's wonderful. And she's also a big main talking point of what I'm going to be chatting with all of you about today. But I wanted to kind of have this podcast serve two purposes. One, I think that there's a lot of power in sharing birth stories. And I loved hearing birth stories when I was pregnant. And two, I wanted to share a little bit about how coaching in particular has supported me in non-business related things, specifically with pregnancy and birth and postpartum. And not to not to like put me in a special category here, but I have a pretty unique story when it comes to all of this. And coaching has played a huge role in just my being able to roll with the punches and be flexible and flowy, which is required if you are going to be giving birth. And um, yeah, I just wanted to share that with all of you. Shake it up a little bit. We talk a lot about business here, but as you know, coaching extends way, way, way beyond that. And this is a little peek into how how it's changed my life on on a very, very personal level. So for those of you who don't know, I have two daughters. One of them is almost four. And then the other one, um, my first daughter's name is Ada and my second daughter's name is Rosie. Um, Ada is almost four. Rosie rang in the new year this year on January 2nd. And um, a little pertinent backstory here, when I was pregnant with Ada, I was diagnosed with an aortic root aneurysm that they found when I was about 10 weeks pregnant with her. I have a history of congenital heart disease. I've had open heart surgery as an infant to close a hole in my heart. But since I was a baby, I've had regular cardiac checkups and I've been fine. Literally my whole life, I was a competitive swimmer. I was good at it. I put my heart to the test. Um, I was a very high level athlete for a good decade in my childhood years. And, um, even in my twenties, I loved to hike. I skydived. I went swimming in the ocean with whale sharks. Like me and my heart have always, like, I've never been afraid of my heart ever giving out on me. And I've always ever, I've always gotten good news whenever I went to the doctor. So I was very surprised whenever, um, I required some extra monitoring for Ada obviously congenital heart disease is genetic and they were like well let's just check you out just to make sure and then i was anticipating everything to be fine and it very much was not so my first pregnancy while i was stable was very stressful because i was living in a small town didn't have a lot of cardiac resources and no one really knew what to do with me i felt very floaty in my care And, um, I remember being at 30, so I was planning a natural as possible delivery. I really, I know that some people are listening to this and being like, why would you opt yourself in for that? But I truly live for life's experiences and I wanted to experience a natural birth or give myself a really good shot at experiencing a natural birth. 
And we made a lot of decisions based on that. Like at 30 weeks, I think I switched to a midwife and we were switching hospitals that was more natural birth friendly. Only two hospitals in the town we were living in, in New York. But I was like making conscious decisions to have a certain experience. Went and toured that hospital, all the things. And then at 38 weeks, um, I had another echocardiogram done and it had shown that the aneurysm had gotten just a little bit bigger and I didn't qualify for a natural birth anymore. And I mean, all reasonable, right? But the conversation that I had with my doctor at the time, he was like, well, so do you want a C-section? And I said, well, you're the doctor. You tell me what you recommend. He was like, well, I can only really write on the paperwork that you want a voluntary C-section. And that like, I understand, but also that's just not what I wanted. It felt, oh, it just felt so gross. And even recalling the story now, I just like, I hate it. I hate it. I hate it so much. Um, But Ada was born. My heart was fine for a little while after she was born. Um, The C-section went, I had a C-section at like three in the morning. So that was an experience in its own, but Ada was here. Ada's heart was fine. My heart was fine for a few months. And um, yeah, then, but that whole experience really left me with a lot of medical provider baggage. Like the whole time during that pregnancy, I never felt like anybody really had my back. I don't feel like anyone really knew my, knew my, the medical ins and outs of my story. No one was asking me enough questions. I was in significant pelvic pain to where like I could barely walk for the last 10 weeks of my pregnancy and everybody just looked at me and said it was normal. And I had, of course, I am so grateful that Ada is here today, but it was a really hard experience that first time. And it left me with a lot of lingering doubts in our medical profession. And so I went in to my second pregnancy, pretty defensive. And we live in Austin now. They actually have a congenital heart center here in Austin, which is pretty uncommon. Um, but I had, Ada was born in 2019. I had an, my second open heart surgery at the very beginning of 2021, where they repaired my aortic aneurysm. And then I got pregnant in... April of 2022. So lots of things happening pretty quickly for me. Um, But I went into my second pregnancy. I got cleared for pregnancy. They said that my heart was going to be fine. Everyone, everyone was on board. I met with a high risk OB beforehand. I got the green lights from all of my medical team, uh, but I still went in with a pretty guarded heart, um, literally (laughs) Uh, for my second time. I really like uh, I'm pretty crunchy. I wanted a home birth experience. I, again, I live for the experiences and I knew that I probably wasn't going to get that. Um, I found a midwife that would take me on and potentially do a home birth, you know, if I got cleared, but of course, high risk OBs, I would imagine are pretty timid towards home births to begin with. And I like, don't meet the criteria for it. So, um, finding providers that will, sign off on things is particularly difficult with, um, giving birth. And I understand why, right. There's a lot of risk here. So, um, I went through my second pregnancy with a repaired aortic root. Um, and my aneurysm was really big, but like, I'm talking to nurses here, so I'm going to use some anatomy terms here, but I have a bicuspid tricuspid valve. So if you can picture where your tricuspid valve should be, I only have two leaflets It has caused my whole aortic root to dilate, but I also had an aneurysm in my dilated aortic root that kind of looked like a grape hanging off of a vine. And that is the part of my aorta that they fixed. So it was right on the other side of my valve. They just clipped it off. They patched it with a piece of my pericardium and things have been stable ever since. Like my, my measurements have been stable. I still do have a dilated aortic root, but... I've always had a dilated aortic root because I have an an anatomical difference in my valve. So I hope that makes sense. If I could draw you a picture, I would. Um, So I get pregnant again. I'm going to the high risk OB. When you go to the high risk anything, you get to do like 500 extra appointments. And um, my anxiety going to these appointments like was manageable, but I was 
highly, highly uncomfortable. I was thinking about the appointments like several days to a week in advance. I was pre-worrying about what was going to happen, what they were going to say. I was worried about feeling supported and like getting gaslit and having someone who's truly going to listen to me. I was so worried that I was also going to develop like a pelvic pain like I did with my first and not be able to walk and then not feel listened to and then like be stuck. Like, how was I going to have a toddler and not be able to walk? Like I had so much worry just attached to my ankles walking around everywhere all the time. And um, it wasn't too bad at first, but like whenever I got into like my second trimester, whenever you start going to the doctor more frequently, it became something that I like couldn't ignore anymore. And um, I also have diagnosed general anxiety disorder that I had been seeing a therapist for for some time. Um, whenever I got diagnosed with my aneurysm, it became again, pretty rampant. <laughs> and um, my surgical team really like had an awesome support squad and they had a psychologist on their team who specializes in congenital heart patients. And so that's all she saw. And I saw her for gosh, two, two and a half years, a really long time. And I was still seeing her at whenever this was all going on. Um, and something I want to mention here is that during this pregnancy, I had a lot of coaching type support or mental health support. So I was going to therapy. I really think that my therapist, I've told her this before, that she would make a great coach because her her style was very coachy and very future oriented and um, just she was really ballsy. And I really loved that about her. And then I was also working with Sarah Kleiner. We have a podcast episode with her um, as a somatic practitioner. And then I was also um, in a coaching space. So, and then also like my business partner is Laura Menard <laughs> and I'm surrounded by coaches all the time. So um, I was held very closely while navigating all of this and during my second trimester, when my anxiety was peaking and just, again, I'm like chugging magnesium three and eight before appointments, just so that I can like keep my heart rate regulated and remembering to breathe. And I was also really honest with my OB and I learned something that I was trying to have all of these conversations with my healthcare providers face to face, which is really hard for me because I usually start crying. <laughs> Of whenever I'm asking for help and uh, it's vulnerable, I just burst into tears. And while that is okay, it's not, I, I like didn't feel like I could communicate everything that I needed or everything that I wanted to in those moments. So thank God for patient portals because before, before I went to an appointment with my OB, had a pretty anxious time. And a few days later, I sent her an email and I was like, I don't want to be, I was so worried about being perceived as like a non-compliant patient, which what does that even mean? But I messaged her telling her that I was anxious, telling her I was having a hard time and her, I don't love that her whole demeanor changed, <laughs> but it did. And I'm like, man, if you could just be this like warm and gentle on the front end, maybe it would have been easier from the beginning. Um, but I was because of all of the support I was receiving, because of all the energy and time I was pouring in through my own healing to be able to show up differently in these appointments, I was able to ask for what I need. And that is not something that I've ever been able to do before. And I was able to like maintain boundaries and um, yeah, just really ask for what I need. I needed them to not talk to me like I was a nurse because I don't know about you, but whenever I am the patient, my nurse brain gets turned off and like my reptilian brain gets turned on and you have to talk to me like I'm a three-year-old because, and you have to talk slow and you have to not make jokes. And, um, my OB, the first time I ever met her made a joke of like, Oh, we're not going to let your heart explode. And, um, as someone who was like six months post-op from open heart surgery, it didn't land well for me. I was super irritated <laughs> with that joke, just because that's how you would talk to a colleague. That's not how you should talk to a patient. And because I was able to speak for what I needed, I was then able to 
enjoy those appointments so much more, right? Because I was going to a high risk OB, I got extra scans. I got extra testing. Like I got all the bells and whistles and it's, I was just ate my, my capacity to enjoy it was expanded because I was able to advocate for what I needed. And which is again, really different than the first, the first experience that I had, um, delivering and carrying Ada. Um, cause I just felt like I was in like a freaking tornado of emotion and completely on my own. Um, but this time was different. This time I was able to like, because I'm more self-aware because I've been through some really tough things with my own health, I was able to catch it really early and I was able to go to my support team very early on in that spiral process and be like, I want to handle this differently and really be able to have a different outcome. So the whole time I'm pregnant, the pelvic pain did come back, by the way, that was a, a bummer, but I was able to get into a pelvic floor PT when I was pregnant and I went to chiropractic. I got massages. I did all this stuff. Um, And actually my pelvic pain went away like the last six weeks of my pregnancy. And y'all, it was, I was amazed. It was crazy. I don't know how that happened, to be honest, because usually pelvic pain only gets worse the longer and bigger you get. Um, But that was my complete opposite experience. So that was wonderful. And then came discussion for delivery time. So I wanted to have a plan. I wanted to try the plan and I didn't want the plan to switch on me last minute like it did the first time. And because I can get on board with just about any plan, I just need time to wrap my head around it, to get on, to just mentally be there, whatever the plan is. And I was open to whatever that was going to look like. However, I preferred a VBAC. I wanted it, I wanted to try it. And my doctors were going to let me. My OB was like, well, your heart is repaired. For my end, I don't see why we can't try and we just need to get cardiac clearance. And so my cardiologist was like, yeah, why not? He didn't give me any restrictions. He didn't say that I had a restriction on how long I could push. I didn't have a blood pressure restriction. I didn't have any of these things. He gave me the green light on everything, which I found surprisingly suspicious. I was like, that's weird. But everyone's just being super calm about this. And everybody's giving me the green light. Maternal fetal medicine gave me the green light. My OB gave me the green light. My cardiologist gave me the green light. So I had the green light. And um, I unfortunately ended up in the ER once, well, twice when I was pregnant, but once for this time for a headache. Whenever you're pregnant, everything, you get to go to L&D, their little triage zone. And um, I had a killer headache. And uh, I went, they gave me some meds. I was going home. It was like 9 a.m. We had been there since about 4 a.m. And uh, my OB calls me as I'm walking out of the hospital and she's like, hey, we need, we need to talk. And it's never great to get those calls. I've been on the receiving end of those calls too many times to know that those are not great phone calls to get. And they had what they call a care conference where all of the doctors meet and talk about you behind your back. And um, once my cardiologist, my MFM, the anesthesiologist and the OB all sat down together and talked about my case, they changed all the rules on me. I no longer had the green light for everything because there had been a misunderstanding. And the misunderstanding came in with everybody thinking that my entire aorta had been repaired and not just the aneurysm. So they thought that everything was reinforced and good to go. However, that's not the case. My aorta is still dilated. The only part that was fixed was the aneurysm. And with that apparent new knowledge to everybody in hand, everything everything shifted. So then they were still going to let me try for a VBAC, but I couldn't push for more than two hours. I was going to have to have an art line. They were going to have to, oh, I think it was going to be highly recommended that I had an epidural for the sake of my blood pressure to keep it down. And I don't know, for those of you who have like given birth that are listening to me talk right now, I'm sure that you're just like chuckling, right? Of like, are they kidding? <laughs> oh, and I was going to have to wear a telly box too. It was going to be wireless, but like still. And IVs and, you know, just like, come on, 
So, uh, I so y'all, I still so desperately wanted, I so wanted to still try. <laughs> Even with all of that, it wasn't going to deter me. However, whenever I was going into, like, whenever I had the headache and I went into um, triage at labor and delivery, wearing the fetal monitors around my belly was like sending me into a panic attack. So, I knew just like with all of the extra gear that I was going to have to wear to pull this off that my anxiety and I were going to come like face to face once again. And that was something that I needed to take into consideration because you have to have a pretty clear head, I would assume, to give birth or or um, least distractions as possible would be preferred. Let's leave it at that. So it was like... I was so devastated and so upset whenever my OB called. Um, Not only was I just leaving the ER and was a little groggy because it gave me IV Benadryl to cope with this headache, but they changed the plan and it like completely ripped to shreds all of this trust that I had built in my practitioners over the past year. And I felt really abandoned in that moment. And that might sound dramatic, but. I had to do so much mental jujitsu to trust their advice, to trust, you know, just like I had to unpack so much and rebuild so much and for it to be a game time decision again, when all of this information about my heart was not new information. This is always how it's been. It's just because they didn't fully read my chart. I was, I was devastated and angry and um, my OB was very apologetic she i think she she was cursing not at me on the phone but cursing about the situation on the phone so i know that she wasn't pleased with her like with how it played out either um but i was uh pretty upset um and that was about at like hmm, 38 weeks i believe almost 39 weeks and um my water broke with ada in my 39th week. So I was anticipating that labor was going to start like any day or no, it broke at like 38 and five days like earlier. So I was anticipating that things could literally start at any moment. And here they are changing the plan on me once again, like it was just deeply rattling. So I left the hospital that day and just immediately like sent up flares to all of my support people um to my friends to rob to to my coaches to my therapist i wasn't even seeing my therapist regularly at this time i just emailed her and asked if i could have a one off session just to process and i didn't want to stay there for long cuz i didn't know how much time i had to shift and i wanted to equip myself with the greatest shift possible knowing that at the end of the day everything is going to be fine but like i need to honor my feelings first so that it can be fine so that's what I did and uh I was mad and I cried some more and I just let myself be for about 24 hours and um even after all of that you know I'm still gonna get to try the v-back I still want to try the v-back however I like wasn't dilated at all and baby girl was still riding really really high like I wasn't dilated I wasn't effaced my body was like no. (laughs) Um, and so I had, I was at the hospital those few days, about a week goes by. I'm like 39 and a half weeks. I get checked again, still not dilated, still not effaced. And I really wanted a sign either way on whether I should try for a VBAC or if I should just go for the C-section. And, um, I really thought team that I was going to get signs for the VBAC. I thought that this was going to be the ultimate redemption story. And that because I wanted something <laughs> that, that it, I was going to prevail. Um, but I kept getting signs that, that like it was the VBAC, that that was the way it was supposed to go. And, um, yeah, so I went to that doctor's appointment and I wasn't really prepared again. I had only been preparing for the VBAC mentally. I was not, or I'm sorry, I was only preparing for the C-section. No, I was only preparing. For, see, here we go. I was only preparing for the VBAC mentally, was not preparing for the C-section. So when I went into that doctor's appointment and, and I still wasn't dilated or effaced, um, I left that meeting or that appointment just again in tears. You're super pregnant. You're super emotional. 
And those feelings were very real for me. And I just wasn't ready. And they had scheduled an induction for the next day. And I was like, inductions don't work if you're not like right on the edge anyway. And I'm not even close. Like I'm setting myself up for failure, like all of this stuff. And so because I was able to advocate for myself, I sent them a message through the blessed patient portal. And I asked for five more days. I was like, I'm not ready to make this decision yet. I'm fine. Baby is fine. Can I just wait until 40 weeks, which would have been that Monday? Um, I think it was like a Wednesday and I'll go like, we'll schedule an induction induction for Monday. If I'm more dilated in a face, I will try for the V back. And if I am not, if nothing has progressed, then I will go for the C-section. And again, team, I think that really highlighting here that being able to advocate for me to medical professionals is like a really big win and they were on board. They, they said, okay, that sounds good. We'll schedule you for Monday. And they were super flexible. And that was a really healing moment for me just to ask for something and be met without any pushback. (sighs) Like even remembering it now, I'm still so proud of me (laughs) for doing that. I know it seems small and it seems insignificant. Um, but it, it really like being able to advocate for myself semi in the moment is a, is a big, big deal. And something that that I've cultivated capacity for specifically through working with Sarah of her coaching me and um, just in some like processing somatically was really helpful. So Monday rolls around and uh, we get there really freaking early as you do. And uh, the resident comes in, introduces himself and he assesses me and I am still not dilated. I am still not effaced. I am still not anything. And because I've had a C-section before, they can't use the medication, uh, Cervidil, I think it is. Like I don't get any ripeners of any kind because it increases chances of uterine rupture. And so they do the balloon situation, um, which is like where they put a balloon, a Foley catheter of sorts. Up there, but it has two balloons in it and one's on one side of your cervix and one's on the other in hopes of forcing it open, which I'm sure is totally casual and not painful at all. Um, <laughs> but he came in and he was like, he's like, you're not dilated like at all, like maybe half a centimeter. And I was like, wonderful. And he goes, I could try to put in the balloon, but it's probably going to be really uncomfortable and we don't know if it's going to work. So the the protocol with the balloon, at least at this hospital, is you put it in, you wait for 12 hours, and hopefully you're three centimeters dilated by the end. By the time that the 12 hours has passed, it's already like 7 or 8 p.m., and then they start the Pitocin. So then you're laboring all night. It You see where we're going here, like super fatigue. Um, and, you know, I already... I already decided how that moment was going to go before I got there. I decided that if I wasn't dilated and not a face, that like that was my sign to go for the C-section. So that's what we did. And I was bummed in that moment, but because I decided how it was going to go beforehand, I was okay. I was, I was all right. And at the end of the day, baby girl's here and everything worked out great. Um, so then we go for the C-section and I've told this story at a conference before when I got to speak. I don't know that I've ever really talked about it here, but I have a particular response whenever I walk into an OR and I've kind of always had it. So I don't know if it is previous remembered trauma by my body from the surgery that I had when I was an infant. But whenever I had my first C-section, I walked into the OR and started crying whenever I had my heart surgery they wheeled me into the OR because they gave me a big old dose of Valium. Um, and I was pretty loopy, but I also got wheeled in there and just started crying. And, um, there's nothing wrong with crying and I don't beat myself up for crying, but like, I know it's coming, right? Like I know that it's like, um, embracing myself for the big intense feelings. And this time when I walked into the OR, I didn't, I didn't immediately start crying. And Again, I think that Sarah, Sarah Kleiner always tells me that tears can be a sign of too much too fast. And I do believe those things to be true for my other experiences. But 
for this particular one, if you've ever had a C-section, your husband's not allowed to be in there with you while they get you all set up. Uh, but they did let my doula come in, which was really kind of them. And she held my hand while I got my spinal and um, just distracted me really like while they got everything else set up. And um, yeah, I was able to be present in that moment. Like my mind wasn't anywhere else, but my mind was right there talking to my doula, aware of everything that was going on, not getting too overwhelmed. And it was so much more enjoyable than all of my other previous experiences. And I, again, I think that to tie this back to all of the work that I did on the front end, right. Of being able to expand my capacity to be in those moments and not completely spiral was so helpful and so healing. And I think how coaching work can really like increase your quality of life because had that moment been traumatic for me, had that moment, had I walked into the OR and completely lost my shit, that's the birth story that I would tell for the rest of my life, right? And I have one of those. <laughs> I already have one of those under my belt and I wanted a different experience. So I cultivated one with with the help of my support team. So um, that's not to say that the C-section wasn't uncomfortable and wasn't hard and that I didn't cry at all because I totally did. If you've ever had a C-section, you know what having your insides ripped out feels like. Um, and I say that because that's what it feels like. <laughs> that's not being traumatic. Um, but this time, whenever they held Rosie over the blue curtain, like I was just able to like, I had the instant moment of love. I was able to say hello to her and touch her face. And Rob and I were able to enjoy that moment together. And even just like remembering it now brings tears to my eyes because it was so beautiful. And it wasn't because I was drugged up or remembering it wrong. Like I've seen the video that my, that my doula took and you can just tell that there was this like overwhelming peace in the room and that I was able to also enjoy the overwhelming peace in the room. And, um, during my C-section, my OB reaffirmed me many times, like, don't feel bad for this decision. Your baby was so high. Her head is a perfect circle. She wasn't even close to being engaged. <laughs> in your pelvis at all. Um, so I, I, I have a lot of, uh, what's the word just like closure around that experience so that I made the right call, that it was on my terms, that I was able to advocate for myself and get what I wanted, even though it's not what I wanted. And that all feels so good in my bones, in my heart and my soul, um, to where I feel like my first birth experience was really hijacked for me. Um, even if the outcome was the same, there was just still different ways that I could have been supported or had support that would have led it to feel different, right? The circumstances would have likely been the same, but how you feel about it is really important too. And uh, so, yeah, everything was um, pretty fine. Uh, you know, they were able to close me up. I'll sp spare too many like gruesome details here, but you know, they, they put you back together, <laughs> they sew you back up and then you go back into recovery. And, um, yeah, it's just like such a serene, it's such a serene moment getting to hold your baby for the first time and look in their eyes. And you're in this like hormonal bubble that just feels so warm and fuzzy. And it's, it's, mm, I know that you can't stay there forever, but it's a really special place to be. And, uh, we really just got to, to soak it in. And again, I think that being able to like over the, since, since getting diagnosed with my surgery, being able to be in the present moment is something that I've had to work very diligently at, um, because being in the present moment, being in my body was, didn't feel safe for a really long time, even after I was surgically repaired, uh, or my heart was surgically repaired, it it didn't feel safe for a long time. It really felt like I was going to jump out of my skin at any moment. And so all of that effort and all of that practice and all of the big feelings I had to feel and the scariness that led here to that moment, like the payoff is so sweet. It's so beautiful. So to be able to like be able to be in my body, to be present with my husband, to be present with my new baby, like that's why that's why 
And that's why, yeah, that's why I did all, all the work. Right. And, um, gosh, I'm just like, so happy. (laughs) I'm so happy, uh, that I did all that work over time. And yeah. So then, you know, we, we had an extended hospital stay after that Rosie, um, had some ABO incompatibility. So she was a little jaundice and we had to stay under the lights for a little bit. Um, but all is well that ends well. And we were able to go home after five days and, uh, yeah, we've been home ever since. And this time around, and this comes with like, I think being experienced as a mom, but also just again, being able to ask for what I need specifically, that is not a skill that I had before. It is a skill that I have now and I'm pretty good at. So um, that meant asking for what I needed in my business a long time ago, being able to completely take a step back and not feel pressured to come back and to build a long, luxurious maternity leave in there as long as I needed or wanted. Um, that, That was a big ask of Laura. And of course, she was on board and wonderful. I know you guys have heard me say this before. Um, But then it also meant that um, like whenever people come over to visit of asking them to bring dinner or to fold the laundry or things that I can definitely do myself, but it definitely helps and feels good for other people to do it too. Um, (laughs) And then to have our doula come over, uh, I hired her for some postpartum hours to where she comes over to our house and she would literally like do the dishes and fold the laundry and hold the baby while Rob and I would crash for two to three hours because we weren't sleeping at night. Um, being able to ask for the little things has been really, really pivotal and, and helpful. And um, for all of our pregnant nurse coaches that are listening right now, or maybe you're in the newborn haze with me, uh, I just want to remind you that because you have the time does not mean that you have the capacity. And that has just been like the theme over the past six weeks of like, yeah, I have the time. Yeah, I've been sitting on the couch like a lot of time. But that does not mean that I have the capacity really to do anything else. And that is okay. That is temporary. And you deserve that time and space to just be, to be in your little bubble. And uh, it wears off. You get, you get restless. And it's all, it's all just a part of it and being, and being able to just be where you're at instead of wishing it was different is, is my biggest takeaway from these past six weeks. So I hope that that story one was at least linear ish and made some sort of sense and also highlights like how how coaching really supports real humans in real life. If I did not have these little pockets of time and space that were just for me to where I could unload, to where I could cry, to where I could feel, it wouldn't have happened. And it would have, I just would have put it in a bottle or put it on a shelf and shoved it somewhere until one day it just comes spilling out. And I don't want to do that. It's not the kind of mom I want to be. And uh, having these two polar opposite experiences with my first and with my second, this is the way to go, fam. This is the way to go. So if you're a nurse coach that works with pregnant people, maybe send them this episode and encourage them to lean in a little bit more that the space that they have with you is theirs and theirs alone and um, they get to use it however they need whether it's like brainstorming how they're going to talk to their doctor and advocate for themselves or how they're going to plan for their postpartum days and so that they can rest and be taken care of. Um, It's all so beautiful and so helpful. So anyway, all right, team, I could ramble on about how beautiful and wonderful it is probably another 15 minutes, but you get it. You get the picture here. And, uh, yeah, if you have any questions, if there's any other specific feedback I could, or details I could share, I know that I've had a few nurse coaches reach out to me and ask how coaching was helpful during my pregnancy. Some coaches that like specifically work with pregnant people. So if there's, after listening to this, if you have any more specific questions that I didn't really answer, please let me know. Don't ever hesitate to reach out. Um, my response time is a little slower these days, but I promise 
I will get to it. But thanks for listening to this episode. This is like therapeutic for me too, just to recall and give myself kudos for all the ways that I took care of me this time. Uh, And I hope that it inspires you to take care of you. And uh, yeah, come join us in the Facebook group. We're there all the time. Um, And we'll see you on the next one, teams. And I need lots of love. Talk to you soon. Bye.